Welcome back and thanks for joining me. Today is the final part in this video series and we will deep dive into some of the weathering techniques I used on this model to get us to a point like this. G'day guys, I'm Clayton and this is Workbench Hobbies. G'day folks, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining me. When we left off in the last video, we had the model painted up and ready to go. Uh, ready to deep dive into some weathering techniques. I started off picking out some of the higher points and details with a light grey colour acrylic paint. With the layers of paint that we've put down, a lot of these finer details can get lost. So just touching the high points like the rivets and the handles and hinges, just touching them with this lighter color paint helps to elevate the detail in these parts. Red leather is now used to paint the straps for the jerry cans or jerry can holders. In reality, these probably would have been gray, but Little pops of colour and things like that can just make for an interesting model. It's now time to start building up our dust effects and the model is coated with two layers of chipping fluid. Now I've changed my airbrush over here to my acrylic only airbrush. This is an acrylic or water based product at least. It never looks great going down this product. It always beads and looks like it's not going to sit properly but as long as you don't flood the surface and you work in a methodical way, you can get a reasonable coverage with this product. I used to use hairspray straight out of the can uh, for this process, but I found this dedicated chipping fluid just seems to be a bit more predictable and just works better than the hairspray out of the can. The chipping fluid is left about 10 minutes to dry off and once dry, I've set myself up a makeshift mask here using some masking tape. I wanted to add a little bit more life to that exhaust section. So just a very rough mask is created with some tape. Then using a light grey acrylic paint, the section is painted. Again, I'm being careful not to flood the part. A couple of light layers is all it requires. Now I really wanted to create some interesting dust effects here so I've used the washable dust for this purpose however because I'd used that product to paint the camouflage I needed to lighten it down a bit so there was a little bit of contrast between the, the camouflage pattern that was on the model and the dust layer that was going down so this is just thinned with water a mix of the washable dust and the light sand and it's sprayed to the lower sections of the tank, the lower edge, where the dust would build up. I'm careful not to be too heavy with my coverage here. Although, if you make a mistake, the chipping fluid is a bit of an insurance policy to be able to clean this up reasonably well. But what I want to do is create some interesting textures here. Horizontal areas of the model are also lightly sprayed in this dust because we're going to create some tones and textures on those horizontal parts of the model as well. Just being mindful not to be too heavy on these sections. The turret is treated in the same way with a light dusting around the bottom edge. Now using an old flat brush moistened with water, I set about removing that dust layer that I've just applied. And you can see by working in a dabbing motion and stabbing motion, it starts to remove it in a random way. Here I start working on the exhaust section in the back of the model, starting to chip away that gray paint from the exhaust. And you can instantly see just those interesting textures coming out of the piece. It's always a good idea to assess your work as you're going because this is a technique that can quickly get away from you. Small sections, assess, do a little more if need be. And you can see by the end of probably two minutes worth of work, you've all of a sudden got this 
interesting visual element on the model now that looks like an old rusty pipe that's had paint burnt off. Now back to removing the dust off the model and or well, the dust paint at least and you can see I'm working in a stabbing motion but also like a downward motion and in which way like the water would run off. Now scrubbing the dust layer off the wheels. Can be a little more heavy handed around these sections because there will be further layers of weathering to follow in these parts. This is just the base layer, just the start. Here you can perfectly see the effect that I'm trying to achieve just working in that downward motion and you can see some of those interesting mottled tones that are starting to appear. This is just using chipping fluid and that dust layer of paint that I put down. This is our initial layer of dusting and it's just to get some of those interesting tones and textures. And again you can perfectly see how that chipping fluid is working. It's activating, that water is activating that chipping layer underneath the paint. Just by gently stabbing and scrubbing we can remove some of that dust layer and just start to build up an interesting layer to our weathering. Now I was probably getting a little bit clever for myself here but I put some oil paints together. Uh, the grey colour is paints grey and I wanted to, I just felt that the contrast in this model was getting lost with that camouflage and these dusty tones and things so by just applying a little bit of Payne's Grey around some of the recessed edges and shadowed areas. Just wanted to try and re-establish some of that depth to the model. Just a small bit of oil paint and then feathering it out with a dry brush. Just a tiny touch and looking to add a little bit more depth to those greys on the top of the model. And again just feathering the oil paint creating those shadows, adding a little bit of depth to those dark greys. No white spirit or anything on that brush, that is just purely a dry flat brush, just working it into the surface of the model, just adding some depth. And the same technique was used on some of the mud coloured areas, just using a lighter coloured oil paint. And working that small amount of oil paint in with that dry brush again. You just get a little glimpse at the variation in those colours there that we've just achieved. It's subtle, but it is present. And on the inside of the fender, just adding a bit of dimension to these parts with the paints grey. This Dark Earth Terrains is an acrylic paste from AK and perfect what we want to do now. And yes, I did get sucked into buying a pot of more or less static grass and a little bit of debris but that's a story for another time. But I've mixed the acrylic mud paste up with some of that scatter and debris. Just want to add a bit more variation to that mud paste so using an old brush I start stippling that paste around the bottom of the model. Trying to work in logical areas that mud would kick up and gather on the real tank. And working the mud on the front sections. Again, try and keep the mud build up to the edges where the tracks would kick off the mud and debris. Try and look at reference photos. Study reference photos. That is your best source of information. Now the mud is built up on the running gear and the idler and the wheels. And it also has to be applied to the tracks. You see just working the paste into the lower areas of the track. I won't put it on the surfaces that are going to touch the ground uh, just because no one will see that. Then using a, a cotton bud moistened with water I'm able to just manipulate that product a little bit. Uh, it will dry hard so you do have to be quick if you wanted to move the product around but it is possible to manipulate it somewhat. I'm going to paint and build up other effects in these areas so this is really just about establishing some textures in that mud finish. Uh, it's not so much about the colour. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Well congratulations you've made it this far into the video so firstly thank you for allowing me on your screens I truly appreciate it. 
please hit subscribe and please give us a like if you like the video. It really helps me a lot. I've left links in the show notes to some of the products I've used. There is no sponsorship. These are the products that I use because I like them and I find they work well. So hopefully that helps you out. Remember to share us around, share this with your friends, and let's enjoy this modeling journey together. Thanks for watching. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? I didn't mean to do that. Please, continue. Then to probably one of the messiest parts of modeling, pigments. So here we have European Earth and Russian Earth. And whilst this acrylic paste is still tacky, I'm able to grind in some of these pigment powders into the product and sitting a bit along the tracks as well. Just helps add a little bit of variation to colors and tones and adds another layer of weathering. If the mud paste has dried, it's as simple as putting a couple of drops of white spirit on the pigment and it will help them settle into the model. You can see I'm removing excess pigment there and I just want to re-establish those high points of the tracks because they would have had the most wear and wouldn't have carried mud on them. So just using my nail, I'm removing some of that product and pull in the big guns, a pair of tweezers to help me re-establish those surfaces. And continuing with the pigments on the wheels now, and I'm using a mix of the two pigments. They're just lightly dusted over the wheels and in behind the wheels. I'm not grinding that in too much. I'm just helping distribute that product over the part. And then using some white spirit and an eyedropper, I'm just going to use capillary action to let that white spirit run through the pigment and that will help bind it ever so softly to the model but it will give us an opportunity to see what that looks like when it dries and give us a foundation to build a few more weathering effects over if you wanted that pigment set and so you could never move it or manipulate it again you would be using a pigment binder however i'm just using white spirit for this purpose so after about 24 hours, the white spirit had dried off and the pigment was presenting as I'd expected. Now I'm just using a makeup sponge here just to help move the pigment around a little bit. I've still got movement in that product. Uh, you can use a brush moistened with white spirit to move it around also. However, the makeup sponge is a really good tool to help settle that effect down. Now I'm just using a brush moisten with white spirit just to clean up the rubber sections remove some of that pigment that's on there i don't really want any pigment on or at least excessive pigment on the rubber sections of the wheels and finally just a cotton bud just to clean those sections up a little more now i'm pleased to announce i have no trademark on this soil from my garden um, but that's what it is. Um, natural debris, natural scatter. It's always great to incorporate organic elements in your model because there's nothing can replicate it quite like the real thing. So using a little bit of scatter that I gathered from out in my front driveway, I just heap piles into recessed corners and again, logical spots around the model where dust and debris would gather. Clearing a little bit away with a dry brush. And then by using sand and ballast freeze from VMS, we're able to hold the debris in place. The bottle comes with an applicator. It's a, it's a little thick, the product, but it's okay. We will get that to work. And just by touching the surface, the capillary action will pull the product through the material. And once it's set, should hold everything in place. This is a water-based product, so you can thin it with water, I believe. I'm um, just wicking away the excess using a dry brush here, trying to avoid any tide marks once it dries. Now back to the areas where we'd set down the organic soil and after the ballast freeze has had time to, to dry off, it can look a little unnatural. So all I'm doing here is just going over with, with a little bit of that European earth pigment, dusting it on the surface and unifying those areas so they look like built up soil. Real earth gives us our textures 
and the pigments will give us our tones. The no tech tail light receives a little bit of red paint. And the rear light or reflector at least was painted with silver and then treated with a dab of clear red. We're going streaky! Yeah! Now I wouldn't be an armor modeler if I didn't do a little bit of streaking. With a touch of oil paint, you can see I'm just creating a fine line. I've used a buff color and a shadow brown. It's really just applying a small amount of oil paint, then using a flat brush moistened with white spirit. Just use a downward dragging motion with the brush. Now there is hardly any white spirit on this brush at all. It is literally moistened with it, then dried off and then just carefully dragged over the surface of the model. It is very easy to remove too much, which doesn't really matter because you can always go back and reapply, but there's a definite fine line. This should be a subtle effect, but it's just gonna create an extra layer in our weathering. Some subtle streaking on the engine hatches. I'm using a different style of brush for these streaks. However, have a bit of a play around on a test model, see what works for you. By working on either side of that streak, you can extend it and you can get all sorts of interesting shapes and patterns. And just by setting a little bit of oil paint up the top and then dragging it down, you can see the interesting effects you can achieve. Now some enamel paints. I have a dark brown and a brown earthy color, which has some remnants of pigment in the mix. This is just about adding more depth to those wheel sections. So using a thinned dark brown enamel wash, just by touching it on the wheel, letting capillary action do the work, it will run around the parts and it could look like oil, it could look wet, it could look muddy. Really just about establishing multiple tones and helping tell the story of your model. And now adding the dark brown wash to some of the muddy splashed areas at the back of the tank and creating some more vertical drips. The dark washes will tend to make the mud look as if it's wet or fresher. By playing with colors on those tones, you can differentiate between dark mud and light mud. It's a heck of a lot of fun. Now I just want to re-establish some of this dust again. So using a mix of flat earth and buff, it's a thin mix. I'm just running around some of those lower edges of the tank and just, you can see, just re-establishing a little bit of dusting. It's that extra layer. So we've got that modeled layer of dust. Now we've got a fresh layer of dust. Focusing on the lower sections of the tank, along the running gear, Again, study references, that is your best source of information if you are looking to recreate something realistic. And even look at resources in everyday life. Look at tractors, look at trucks, look at the way mud and dust gathers up on everyday items. It's all there to see. And probably the best matte varnish I've ever used, uh, VMS matte. This will just unify some of the different gloss levels that have appeared on the model due to the different mediums I've used. It also seals all the work we've done, seals all the paint, all the effects, so it's a layer of protection for us as well as unifying the whole model. And now one last weathering step, dark mud and Kursk soil and by Loading a brush up with this product and flicking it against an airbrush needle, you can see some of those interesting splattering tones that are being created, like fresh mud being kicked up. And of course, that needs to be employed along the entire lower sides of the model. But again, try to think logically. Mud and dirt is gonna kick up more at the back of the model, or the tank, than it would at the front. So focus your efforts towards the back section of the model and the lower section of the model. 
This is a messy technique and it is inevitable that you will get some of the paint where you don't want some of the paint. So then just using a brush with some white spirit and it's just easy enough just to go around and remove or blend some of those splashes that have gotten spots you didn't want them to go. You can see it's just a very simple process and it's gone. Then using bitume or bitumen, I believe, loaded onto a flat brush, quite heavily thinned, and then speckled across the horizontal sections of the model. You can see it just builds up extra grit to the model. Just focusing this on all of the horizontal sections, just that little bit more depth to the paintwork. And finally, engine grease. Now this is very messy, this oil paint, but it's very good and it dries with a nice glossy finish which gives the illusion of the paint being like grease. So where we'd painted some of these enamel washes around the wheel hubs and things, it was helped along using this engine grease oil paint. As you can see, it really looks like leaching grease and the dirt all getting mixed in with it. And you can see once everything is dry, that realistic look that those layered pigments and oil paints has created on those wheel sections. Gunmetal pigment using a silicon brush is used to finely buff those high edges of the tracks as well as the gun barrels. Having those edges of the tracks painted in the silver from the steps before, this just helps re-establish those high points and the two processes work beautifully together. And now it was time to add the figure. Now the kit does come with a figure, but I wanted to give this one a little bit more personality. Now nothing can spark a figure up better than an aftermarket head as well as aftermarket hands. So I found the body of the figure that I really like from a set of Tamiya figures and then I set about taking his hands off. Oh, God! Oh, I did not see that coming. And the aftermarket Hornet head has quite a long neck and if we can recess that through the neck section of the figure, it's just going to give us a better looking pose or more cohesive look. And the hand sections, I'm just looking to open the sleeve of the jacket up so it looks like the hand is coming out of the sleeve rather than just stuck on the end of it. I start this process with a micro drill, just establishing the first hole. And then using a larger drill bit, the part is drilled out even further. And then the excess plastic is carefully removed using a sharp hobby blade. The aftermarket hand sections are then glued in place using super glue. And as you can see, it looks like the hand is coming out of the sleeve rather than being stuck on the end of it, which is exactly what I wanted. And then to test fit the head, you can see it will slot beautifully in that hole and it will look cohesive with the body, look like the neck is coming out of the shirt. And we're well on our way to having a happy chappy. Because the aftermarket head I'm using was bald, You're bald. I'm using to me a two-part sculpting putty here to create some hair for this fella. By combining two equal parts of this product by twisting them together, we can create a small piece of putty that I can use to sculpt the hair and help attach the hat to the top of the head. And the small piece of putty is put on top of the head that I've trimmed down and the excess carefully removed with a sharp blade. A toothpick is now used to start the sculpting process on the back of the figure's head, just using a rolling motion, like a rolling pin sort of style of thing, just to even out the putty and create the foundation for the hat to go on. The commander's cap 
came from the Tamiya set of figures that I got the body from and now I'm just wedging that down on top of the putty and again removing away some excess. The cap has a good flat foundation to sit on and it will look like it's actually sitting on the figure's head rather than floating above it. The sculpting process of the hair now takes place using the tip of an old airbrush needle and this was actually far more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be. I, I managed to create some interesting variation in the figure's hair and just by carefully working around thinking about where hair might be sticking out of the side of the cap and how far down his neck it would go I was actually starting to create a little bit of personality on this figure and I was really enjoying it. And there's no doubt that the hair on this figure has really elevated the look. I was very pleased. So now it was time to get him ready for painting. So I drilled a small hole out in the bottom of his leg and super glued a toothpick so I had something to hold during the painting process. Given the time constraints of this video, I won't go into how I actually painted the figure but I will commit to doing a figure painting tutorial at some point in the future. There was some debate online as to whether the cap and the jacket were time appropriate for this model. However, I had enough evidence to suggest that possibly it was okay. So I made peace with it and called this model done. It's been quite the journey and I've really enjoyed sharing this with you all. I am new to this YouTube world, so please share in the comments any thoughts, any ideas, any suggestions you feel that might make these videos better or more entertaining at least. Please share this with your friends, spread the word. Thank you for allowing me on your screens. I do not take it for granted. I've already started working on my next project so I'm really excited how that's coming together and I can't wait to share that with you. I will do my best to post something every two weeks and hopefully connect with this community that we're building here. Give us a like if you like the video, please subscribe and remember guys this is the greatest hobby in the world and we are all in this together. Connect with your community, share with your friends, Reach out if you need help. There is always someone there to listen. Thank you again for watching. I really do appreciate it. And remember, be kind to each other. See you soon.